name's uh, Mohammed Bilal. I'm half Iraqi, half Lebanese. And the last time I went was in this year. I went uh, in the summer, about two weeks before Ramadan. Can you just tell us your name, where you're from, and the last time you went for Umrah or Hajj? Yeah. My name is Mohammed Ali Zaini. I'm from Najaf, Iraq. And I went in July this summer, 2011. My name is Kothar Mahsin. Um, I'm from Najaf, Iraq, and I went to Umrah in um, July 2011, so this summer that just passed. My name is Zahra Al Hamadi. Um, I'm from Iraq, and I went to Umrah during July 2011. I'd always heard, like, for example, as soon as these Muslims, these Shia Muslims, as soon as they enter the airport, they would start searching the bags for things like Turab, mm -hmm. the Turab, the earth, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet to pray on and they would take it away from them and they would just pester them and be rude to them and call them kuffar. Mm -hmm. So I found, that, I found that hard to believe. I, would, I also heard stories about um, a Shia group that went once. Um, they were beaten up by the Saudi police and there was even pictures of them bruised yeah. and everything, which, which was really disappointing to see something like that. I've heard a story from my father actually that um, there was this old man, like he was proper aging, like, you know, it's someone who you would get up in the bus for to let him sit down, you know. And as he was um, in Baqiyah, he was shouting out salawat, after which he was like attacked by the... With attacks, I don't actually mean beaten, but like they came after him and they took him away from the people. Yeah. Because, you know, with us, yeah, when someone shouts out salawat, everyone starts joining in and stuff. Yeah. So they really wanted to prevent some, um, they really wanted to prevent that from happening. But, you know, it's an old man and they came to him as a group of soldiers and, like, you know, a lot of stories have been told and I'm sure everyone is kind of familiar with it. But personally, I didn't feel scared or nervous about going there anyway because um, I've had some experiences with some extreme people at my college who, you know, they've always been like attacking me about, you know, Shia, this, Shia, that, you know. Um, and, you know, f from all my discussions and debate that I've had with them, I knew that no matter what you say, you can bring out verses from the Quran, verses from uh, a hadith from their own books like Bukhari and uh, Sahih Muslim, all that, they wouldn't take it. So I was like, you know, I'm not going there to debate with anyone. I'm going, to, I'm going there to worship Allah and to become closer to yeah. Allah, you know. I'm going there to sort out my own affairs between me and my Lord. I'm not going there to convince them that what I believe in is right. So I wasn't nervous about that at all. Like, I had set in mind that I'm going to do my thing and if I leave them alone, um, I'm not really going to give them a reason to come after me. When you actually got there, what was it like? What, you know, was everything everyone had said true or do you think it was exaggerated? How did people treat you? I mean, like with, with the people, like the other pilgrims that were there, um, we, we kind of had it both ways. You, you know, wherever you go, you're going to find good and bad people. So. Um, you know, some people, they, they found out we were Shia and they just accepted it and they interacted with, yeah. with us in a normal manner. But you had others, like instantly they would change. It's like when they'd see us um, stand up to pray, arms, you know, by our sides, it's like, uh, that's it, you know, they change and we, we'd get looks from people and, um, you know, it, it was sad to see that, like everyone talks about unity so much yeah. and in these holy places, it should, you know, that's like the most important thing. Yeah, I did experience some um, like negative aspects while I was there. Like for example, when the whole like we went with a youth group for Amre and we were all sitting outside the Jannat al Baqiyah to read the Akumail. And um, yeah, they actually came and they told um, the person reciting, like, can you not recite out loud? But obviously, because we were the, were the whole group and we wanted to do it together, um, after they left, we carried on reciting, but in a lower tone maybe, but you know, we could still hear it. So they kept on coming back to us, and then it came to a point that they actually took the sheikh who was with us to, to the side to like talk to him. But like, obviously the guys who were in the group, they didn't allow that, and yeah. everyone got up and like, you know, trying to 
you know, if you touch him, you have to come through us kind of thing. Once I was with my dad, and when we went, and he was just reading the ziyar, it was me and him and my brother. And, you know, just one of the guys came and just tried to snatch the book. You know, like, no salam alaikum, what are you doing? Just totally disrespectful. Yeah. And you can see this guy, like, he has no Islamic teaching. And these are the kind of people that are put as guards in the haram. And, yeah, he just tried to take the book. He's like, my dad's like, what are you doing? And he's like, this haram, this bid'ah. He doesn't even know what we're reading, you know. Well, he just heard, assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah, he's a like, bid'ah. And it says, assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah, right on the Prophet's yeah. grave. And so then he's like, oh, let me call the sheikh, let me call the imam. And then the imam comes and he, he sees the book. He's like, let me see the book. He's like, hey, you can see it in my hands. Looked at it. Then he started, I don't know, he started arguing about something. And then my dad answered him. And then the imam was like, he couldn't say anything. So then he just, he was like, okay, do you want to come down to the office and we'll show you what happens? And my, my father was like, is this, is this your, only, you know, your only way to answer my question? You can't yeah. do anything about it. So you can see like, for the Imam to actually say something like that, you can see that there's no true Islamic teaching there. When it came to reading ziyarat and visiting the graves, what kind of restrictions were there? How were you treated by the guards over there? Well, they would be in front of every single important figure. For example, in front of the four holy Imams, in front of, um, uh, I think it was, uh, Ibrahim or Ismail ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar, who is the brother of Imam Ali, the first Muslim to be born in Africa, or Aqil, the brother of Imam Ali, or Fatima al-Sa'diyya, or Uthman, or be any single important figure, a very important figure, yeah. there would be one of their sheikhs standing right next to the grave, and if he sees anybody um, asking uh, for something, he would be the first to just literally jump on them, not physically, but with words, and he, you know, you're doing shirk, you're, and when people try to reply to him, he says that he speaks to them as if they're dirt. And the thing is, he would be standing on top. So he'd be looking down at you. And he'd just be thinking, you know, you've come here after, after Salat al-Subah, okay? And you're trying to have a peaceful uh, dialogue with these people, these amazing people. And then you have one of these, you know, uh, ignorant people just standing there and trying to block your way with anything, any possible means. And... This, uh, this one point, um, one of the people from our Hamla he decided to cross the bounds by doing a salawat, okay? And in reply to this, he actually had to run because the guards tried to hold him and he had to actually run back to the hotel. But because they were angry, they didn't catch him, they started to literally just push everybody, shove them. Um, P uh, Saudi police filled the baqiyah, they, they just filled it. Um, two police cars parked outside. Um, and I watched them, there was a man, it was just a simple Iranian man who was just doing du'a. They dragged him out of the crowd, they cuffed him and they just took him away. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, um, it really hurts me that although we talk about historical events and people sometimes they ask, why is it that you, you Shia, I still, you know, you really care about um, the Khilafah being taken away from Imam Ali alayhi salam, or the way that they treated, you know, the way they oppressed and killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam, or the way they treated the other Imams because it's still happening today. And even their graves, yeah. the, the actual Sunnis, you know, the Ottomans, they had actually built real and graves to represent these respected people. They desecrated them. It just shows how even after they're dead, they're still being oppressed. And not only are they being oppressed, their followers are being oppressed as well. So it just shows that the, their set of mind, it's so not actually fighting for Islam, but rather than fighting to cause as much devastation as possible. And they're so ignorant that even when you show him something like a hadith or a Quranic verse that works against what he's saying, he'll just reject it and say, no, 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 you, you fabricated this yeah. with your Shia lies or you know, as if I could fabricate a Quranic verse or anything like that. Do you have any other restrictions placed on you um, when it came to other acts of worship like salah or you know, reading du'as, anything else? Um, not really. I mean, like... Uh, like one time, actually, my brother was reading Quran and the adhan went off. So my brother just wanted to finish the surah he was reading. There was time for him to finish it. So one of the guards came up to him. He's like, stop reading. Then he's like, I just need to finish the surah. 
as a Muslim, you'd respect that and you'd leave him to finish. Yeah. But as a crazy human being, and these, these are the guide, these are the guards, sorry, in the mosque, you know. Yeah. He took the Quran and <laughs> threw it on the floor. And you just think to yourself, these people are brought up with Wahhabi teaching. It's this, and you can see it's this fear, fearful, fearful mm. and hateful and disrespectful um, attitude towards other humans, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, you know. And, and then, you know, you get, you get people thinking Muslims are crazy or extremists. It's all because of this Wahhabi mm. fuel that's coming in and that's what the media looks for. Yeah. You know, it's not going to go and look at a nice Muslim praying, following the true Islam. It's going to go for someone who's ridiculously crazy and yeah. mental, doing stupid things, coming up with crazy ideas. And that's what most of these Wahhabis are. Not all Wahhabis, but most of them. They have this, they have this um, mentality and ideology. Do you think a lot of them don't really understand their own beliefs and they're kind of, it's very dogmatic? Definitely, definitely. I mean, like... One time, I was taking a camera into the haram, and then the, the Islamic police is like, this is haram. I was like, what do you mean it's haram? He's like, it's haram to take pictures. I was like, okay, what about the king? Isn't his picture everywhere? And he's like, that's the king. <laughs> I'm thinking, what is he, a prophet? What, yeah. what do you mean that's the king? And it's like, even when you ask them simple questions, I asked him a question, and as soon as they see that this is a question which requires some sort of logic, they realize, oh, you're Shia, aren't you? Yeah. And it's funny because that's what Islam is about. It's, about. it's about logic. And the really scary thing about this Wahhabi fuel is that, okay, they go into the Sunni mosques, they influence them, but this influence is full of illogic or even going against logic yeah. and believing that logic is wrong. I believe that Islam is not logical at all. As women, um, to, you know, we, we couldn't visit the graves anyway. You know, they, they don't um, allow women to enter graveyards, which is ridiculous. Like, um, when we went to, for example, Janatul Baqiya, it was really heartbreaking because you've come all this way and you want to visit your imams and all these um, important figures, but you can't. And we had to drive... Um, all the way around to the other end where the gate is, just so we can get a glimpse of the inside and, and read the yeah. ziyarat. And it was, it was just sad, you know, that they'd put these, these laws that, you know, they, they've just made them up themselves. When it comes to all the restrictions that are placed, um, especially for the Shias, when it comes to reading ziyarat, like you said, or praying or whatever it is, um, do you think it's fair? Oh no, it's totally unfair. And like you said, only specific, especially for the Shias. Forget the Shias, this is unfair for all the Muslims that go there. Yeah. It's not only Shias who go to visit the graves. It's the Sunnah of the Prophet to go and visit the graves. Yeah. Whether you're Shia or you're from Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. It's all Muslims who goes there, go there to visit the graves of these people, these Imams, these Prophets, who done so much for us who brought up this religion for us, showed us the right and wrong, and they want people to just forget about them. Now, it's funny when you think about it, because why do they want us to forget about these people? There's people buried under that earth who stood up against tyrants. Yeah. There's people buried there who stood up against, against oppression. What about Shias that were already residing there? Um, did you have much interaction with them? And if you did, how, how was that? How did they treat you? Um, yeah, we did, we did uh, meet um, quite a few Shia there. They, they had their own place, and I think that, that was really great. That was really nice to see that they had their own place where they, they felt comfortable, you know, they could practice their ziyara without having someone to get rid of them. But they, they, they did seem like they felt like they were under pressure. They were limited as a citizen of that country. It was actually one of the most extraordinary experiences in Omar. I mean, uh, on our fourth day there, we visited the Nakhada of Medina. And these people are people that are being persecuted over time. And they are sort of like the only, um, 
like the only source of real Shia inside Medina. And they've been pushed inside this area, and th that's where they all gather, and that, that's where they, you know, they practice, uh, mm. you know, the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt without persecution. And that's why I thought until I, we first went there, and it was very, very surprising because I felt like I was back in Najaf or something like that. You know, just seeing them, yeah. it made me feel very comfortable. And to be honest, the place itself was very beautiful. Um, even though it was just natural, I mean, it was just palm trees and water, etc. It felt like I was sitting in a place where the Prophet himself would have lived, or Imam Ali alayhi salam, or any of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. So I felt very peaceful over them. And they were very, very, very kind and welcoming. And um, I could tell that they were living rough lives from the, the clothing that the children were wearing, from the way that um, the women were begging, from the way that the men just looked, you can just see the pain on their faces, that, that you know, you could just um, sort of foresee what was going to happen, what had happened to these people before. So in terms of them, their, their akhlaq and their manners, they were absolutely amazing. But in terms of the way they've been treated, it's absolutely horrific and disgusting. And um, I can't specifically remember his name, but the sort of like the alim, the scholar of, of the Taqala, uh, he passed away a while ago. And so it was his son that was uh, needing. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to him, I, you know, this man, you could just see knowledge just, you know, just shining on his face. I mean, the man was just, um, the way in which he spoke to me, the way in which he was uh, telling me about things that had occurred, it was very um, touching and emotional. And that's why I decided to take a lot of pictures of the place. And when I got back, I posted them on Facebook straight away because I wanted people to see where these people were living and how they were living. And although it looked like a beautiful place to me, for them it was sort of like they were being tortured by the regime. Yeah. And um, as I researched more and more after I got back into how the Nakhala are the only people that are, you know, okay now, as in, in terms of them being there, because you know, the others have just been wiped out completely, I started realizing there used to be people in areas such as Ahad, uh, other places, the Shia, they used to, you know, the tribes, and they used to live in these areas. And the Saudi regime would basically just send forces, a battalion, whoever, and they would go and they would just massacre these people instantly. We paid them a visit, and I think um, it was like, from our whole time in Medina, that was probably the most amazing experience um, because. You know, from the second we walk, we walked through the gates, um, we received such courteous hospitality. It was like you know you felt at home, and it was better than any five star hotel. It was like it was amazing, and um, despite them being oppressed, and you could see that they were like um, the way they were treated by the authorities over there was just it was disgusting. You know, I remember like we got into this uh, prayer place, and there were so many turbas all over the place. Like you yeah. could just pick it up and pray. And like us, all the girls, we were like so excited about it. Like this, so amazing that we actually we were taking pictures of the Torah and making, like we were really excited about it. So this woman was like, you know, like she was interested. Like, where are you guys from? This and that. And we were like, we're from London. So it's not like we can't practice our religion, but it's just in the past few days that we have been here. Yeah, we've really <coughs> like missed being open about what we believe in. Yeah, like. Um, we've been like trying our best not to stand out and to like, you know, fit in with the whole crowd and stuff. And yeah, it was a really amazing experience because, you know, you've personally I really felt like you know those people are a part of me. You really feel that brotherhood with them. You're not scared. Yeah. And you now I remember as we were leaving, like there was this one girl and. I don't even know her name, but I was just, I just hugged her and like, because that's how close they made us feel, that's how welcoming and warm they were to us. My uncle himself, he lives in uh, Saudi, he, he works in Riyadh, and he has to hide his Shia identity, because if he reveals it, not only will he lose his job, he might lose something else as well. So um, it just shows the, the way that the Shia are treated there, it's not Islamic at all, and they treat them as if you know, they've committed some kind of atrocity or kufr or something like that. There were some women that we spoke to over there and one of the women actually said um, to us, she was like, oh, I, I 
respects your, your, you know, I respect you guys, you have so much courage, because we told her of some of the, the incidents that had happened. But in reality, you know, they were the brave ones, they were the ones that, um, you know, deserved the respect. It just shows the way they, um, they oppress the people, and they do this through two things. One, it's the media, okay, because they control the media, they have the economy, um, the, the oil rich, uh, you know, the natural resources, okay? And they're also, because we know the Saudi government is allies with, you know, Zionist Israel, the allies with uh, America, these people have the money and they have the influence to brainwash people, okay? And um, they claim to be Sunnis, but we know for a fact they're not actually Sunnis. Our Sunni brethren, uh, the brothers and sisters, they're very, because they don't actually have the leadership, it's very easy to lead these people astray. Yeah. But you can easily <coughs> define the difference between, for example, say Sunnis in Egypt to Sunnis in Saudi. Yeah. Because, you know, even in Egypt or other countries, they, they treat Shia so much better. They treat them like their own brothers or sisters. Yeah. But in Medina and Mecca, they are actually oppressed in every single way. Do you think that um, because of the behavior of the Wahhabis in um, Saudi Arabia, we, no, not everyone, but a lot of people tend to clump the Sunnis with them, and so yeah, we... Yeah, I think that that's a very, very big misconception, because we know for a fact that if somebody um, does something and he says, you know what, I'm representing these people, and he does something that's not actually a representation of those people, for example, uh, the people that uh, did 9-11, they claim to be Muslims, yeah. but in every single way they oppose what the Holy Quran actually teaches. Mm -hmm. So you can tell they're not Muslims, okay? So in the same way, these people, they claim to be Sunnis. They claim to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. It really makes you realize that, you know, we need to do something about it. Like, we can't just live here and say, you know, I don't have to deal with these things. They are, you know, not something that's affecting me when I'm at home. But we have to, like, realize that, you know, the Shia in Saudi are our brothers and sisters, and you know, when we experience the when we experience these things, while well, we're there for like only two three weeks, we really need to realize that these people are going through much more on an everyday basis. Do you think that um, that visit in particular made the group um, more grateful? for the freedom we have here to express our beliefs. Yeah, definitely. I mean, over here, we have it. We have it so good. Like, we can openly, um, you know, uh, practice. We During Muharram and, and Ashura, we, we go to mosques. We have, we, you know, we go out for marches. And it, it's it's easy for us. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't have the authorities on our backs 24-7. Whereas over there, it's like... Just, just praying, for example, when they're out in public, they, they can't just um, pray, you know, how, how they yeah. usually would. And it's, it's sad to see that this still happens in, like, this day and age. Do you ever feel a bit reluctant to go back? No, not at all. Not in any single way. Because that was, by far, the most amazing experience of my life. And the thing is, when you really want to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to connect to His servant, the Holy Prophet. There is nothing that can stop you, nothing. And although um, when we were reading Dark Queen on a Thursday night over there, and they came, they interrupted us, and they, you know they forced us to uh, just move out of the way, and they just separated us, and then we had to go back to the hotel and read it over there. It just shows that even though they actually separated us and, and you know stopped the du'a, they can actually stop us from connecting to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Because even if you know you can't even utter words, even if they shut your mouth. Even in your heart, you will be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no matter what they do, it doesn't stop you from you know, connecting to Allah in the way that you ask for forgiveness for the past sins you've committed. And you ask for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen your iman, your faith. And um, you visit the Holy Prophet and sitting in his presence is something that I personally can't describe. You actually have to go and sit in his presence and you really, really can imagine him sitting it there and watching you. So when you sit there, you actually talk to him as if he's there. And that's why there's a hadith which says, uh, that, well, the Holy Prophet, he says, um, whoever visits me, you know, after I'm dead, is as if he's visited me during my lifetime. And that's why when people go, they don't actually have this idea that do you know what, these Wahhabis are going to stop us, they're going to oppress us, they're going to, they don't care. It was such an amazing experience and it was so spiritually enlightening. Um, it, it was like a journey, you know, to, to find peace and to just get closer to Allah. And, 
and I think when you when you experience something so amazing, you you don't really think about the little negative things that happen. They seem so insignificant, yeah. and um, I, I would definitely want to go back. I mean, like I think a lot of us didn't even want to leave, um, and and just you know being being close to Allah in that way and being near the Kaaba was was enough to just make me want to go back. Yeah. While you were on your trip, were there any incidents or stories that you think are going to stay with you? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, one day I was in the Rawla with my friends and um, we were really, like, trying to get to... There's, like, um, a kind of bookshelf which is, like, right in front of the Shabak of the Prophet's grave. And, you know... As she has, like, you know, when we go to Kerbala and Najaf, we are always used yeah. to holding the shabak, yeah. kissing it, you know. Um, when we were there, like, we were pushing, like, it's not just us pushing, but you know how the whole crowd yeah. is kind of shoving along, and we were, like, so badly trying to get hold of the shabak. And once we got there, like, um, we wiped some cloth, this and that, on the shabak, and then, like, women behind me, I suspect they are Shia as well because you know they took out Turab, they yeah. took out um <coughs> Sibhai and you know like they were all like asking like because like we were like in the front row so they were asking if we could like um wipe it on the yeah. Shabrak and um I did that for her and then this lady who was walking there she come she has this kind of stick thing and she was like, you know, hitting everyone's hand off it, saying, shirk, shirk, you can't ask him to, you know, intercede for you, you can't ask him for your hajat, yeah. that's something you do for Allah. And, you know, I just remember, like, you know, really sneaky, just waiting for her to pass yeah. us, and then go, starting again, and then every time she comes back, just like, you know, looking all innocent. And while you were on your trip, were there any moving incidents that are going to stay with you? Um, yeah, uh, uh, while while we were um, in Mecca, um, we you know we, we would go to um, to uh, we'd sit near the Kaaba and read Ad'iyah. Um, so so during um, uh, one of these times when we were reading Dua, uh, we were reading Dua by Hamza Thamali. We had um, one Egyptian woman come over to us. She she had um, she was praying, and as soon as she finished, she she came over and she was so taken by the words of the du'a. She she just stood there and she was like, you know, what is this? What is this du'a that you're reading? It, it sounds amazing. So um, you know, uh, someone from our group uh, read read some of the words out to her and you could see that she was so touched by it, she was so taken by it and it was beautiful to see that even and she, uh, she did tell us that she was um, you know she was Sydney she wasn't Shia and um, but it was it was touching to see that she had so much respect for for our beliefs and yeah. she she wanted to learn she wanted to understand and um, you know I think we need more people like that you know because a lot, of, a lot of the Wahhabis, um, they put the wrong idea into into people's minds. Like they they make people's perception perception of Shia um, <coughs> like a really negative one. So it was nice to see that there were still people out there that didn't look at Shia in that way and were really open minded and, and um, wanted to learn about you know our way of life and, and the yeah. teachings of Ahlul Bayt. If anything, it motivates us to, you know, be out there, show that, you know, we are true Muslims, we want to go Hajj, we want to, you know, practice our religion, we have to, like, you know, show them that it's not just their place, you know, it might be in a country that's governed by, you know, Sunnis and, you know, Wahhabis, but at the end of the day, we are Muslims and... You know, in Surat al Hamran, it actually says that whoever enters Mecca, which is referred to in that ayah as Becca, mm -hmm. um, whoever enters it, it should be safe. So, you know, like they don't have the right to make us have fear in our hearts yeah. when we would want to go there. I think from each time I went, it just gave me the experience to understand and learn from these people. And 
what I learned, one of the main things I learned is that I would be a fool if I wasted my time with a fool. To, for me to send argue with these people yeah. or to react with them is foolish from me. They just want me to react. They want me to do something stupid so they could arrest me or beat me up or anything. Yeah. I'm going there to visit the Prophet. I'm going there to visit the house of God. I'm going there to do my Umrah or my Hajj. That's my aim. So I don't need to worry about some ignorant people who want to try and ruin that for me. Um, you know, I wanted to go to the top floor once and it was closed. Mm. And I just went up to the Imam. I was like, can I please go to the door? I, I talked to him nicely. And he let me through. And he's like, you're Shia, aren't you? I was like, yeah. And I asked him, what do you know about Shia? And he's like, this and this. And then after talking to him for about an hour, he was like, then why is there so many misconceptions? Why is there all these things I've heard yeah. about Shia? You know? And he's like, you've changed my whole idea about Shia 180 degrees. Uh, Muhammad Bilal. I'm half Iraqi, half Lebanese. And the last time I went was in this year, I went uh, in the summer, about two weeks before Ramadan. Can you just tell us your name, where you're from, and the last time you went for Umrah or Hajj? Yeah. My name is Muhammad Ali Zaini. I'm from Najaf, Iraq, and I went in July this summer, 2011. My name is Kawthar Mahsen, because um, I've had some experiences with some extreme people at my college who, you know, they've always been, like, attacking me about, you know, Shia, this, Shia, that, you know. Um, and, you know, f from all my discussions and debate that I've had with them, I knew that no matter what you say, you can bring out verses from the Qur'an, verses, uh, hadith from their own books, like Bukhari and uh, Sahih Muslim, all that, they wouldn't take it. So I was like, you know, I'm not going there to debate with anyone. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going there to attack, I don't actually mean beaten, but like they came after him and they took him away from the people. Yeah. Because, you know, with us, yeah, when someone shout, shouts out salawat, everyone starts joining in and stuff. Yeah. So they really wanted to prevent some, um, they really wanted to prevent that from happening. But, you know, it's an old man and they came to him as a group of soldiers and like, you know, a lot of stories have been told and I'm sure everyone is kind of familiar with it. But personally, I didn't feel scared or nervous about going there anyway. Because I found that hard to believe. I also heard stories about um, a Shia group that went once. Um, they were beaten up by the Saudi police and there was even pictures of them bruised yeah. and everything, which, which was really disappointing to see something like that. I've heard a story from my father actually that um, there was this old man, like he was proper aging, like, you know, it's someone who you would get up in the bus for to let him sit down, you know. And as he was um, in Baqiya, he was shouting out salawats, after which he was like attacked by the... With, um, I'm from Najaf, Iraq, and I went to Amra um, July 2011, so this summer that just passed. My name is Zahra Al Hamadi. Um, I'm from Iraq, and I went to Umrah during July 2011. I'd always heard, like, for example, as soon as these Muslims, these Shia Muslims, as soon as they enter the airport, they would start searching the bags for things like Torab, mm -hmm. the Torab, the earth, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet to pray on, and they would take it away from them, and they would just pester them, and be rude to them, and call them kuffar. Mm -hmm. So I found that 